As we bring our conference to an end, I invite Air Marshal M. Martins Penin, Chairman and President, the Peninsula Foundation, to deliver the President's introduction. Ambassador Radwan, you've seen him for the last two days. It really, uh, you really uh, need no introduction about him. You've heard him. Uh, uh, he, he's spoken and, uh, both yesterday and today very actively in the panel discussion. I would only like to highlight a very important aspect of him. He's a very erudite scholar, historian, and uh, uh, deeply involved in understanding the Indian history, particularly the Mughal history. And I would like to highlight a very important publication, particularly students are there from Department of History. And I think you need to pull out those books and read. Uh, his publication include a very interesting book, Attendant Lords, Bairam Khan and Abdul Rahim. I know who, I, I hope you all know who Bairam Khan is. If you know about Akbar, then you probably get to know that. Courtiers and Poets in Mughal India. Uh, the other book is People Next Door. The Curious History of India's Relations with Pakistan. Uh, the former was awarded the Mohammed Habib Memorial Prize by the Indian History Congress in December 2017. The ambassador obtained his PhD from Jalal Nehru University in 1992 for his dissertation in economic history of India. And his Barbas experience and diplomatic uh, service is a very fine, uh, well regarded diplomat. And I think his, his support as Director General of the ICWA, ICWA support to this conference, to TPF, is very valuable and I thank you for that. Let me now invite the ambassador to deliver the valedictory address today. Good afternoon, Emarshal Madheshwaran, Brigadier, Albert Patrinathan, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, all the scholars and officers who attended uh, different sessions. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to deliver this uh, valedictory address. May I say at the outset that the ICWA, the Indian Council of World Affairs, and I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, in a few minutes, uh, feels greatly privileged to be associated with the Peninsula Foundation. And may I also congratulate you and your entire team for uh, truly a very, very good uh, uh, conference and seminar and we have had very intensive uh, discussions over the past uh, uh, two days. Uh, uh, there are many things which come to my mind but I would really like to begin by thanking the Women's Christian College for uh, giving us this opportunity to come here and visit this wonderful uh, institution and I had the chance to I had a chance to see uh, your motto this morning, which is here, uh, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, three words, uh, light it to light it. And really to me it sums up so much uh, of the philosophy which has underwritten great institutions of this kind uh, all over our country, but also in many other countries uh, abroad, that when you have something it is important also to share it and in the course of our discussions yesterday and today there was much talk about, some talk about uh, uh, one factor which we don't discuss enough when we discuss uh, foreign policy and strategic issues which is our social indicators, the HDI and in fact that is critical to, critical to uh, any conception of national power which we may, uh, which we may have. So the idea of uh, uh, lighted to lighten really sums up uh, 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 an approach to HDI uh, or to improving uh, education levels, literacy levels, which we can have. I think one very important indicator which we should judge any society by uh, is what is the charity to GDP ratio. Uh, I don't know where India stands in that, but I do hope it stands uh, well in it because it really tells you something about uh, the society uh, itself and when you look at the problems we confront today, uh, not just of inequality because inequality is uh, a worldwide phenomena and perhaps there are uh, certain positive attributes which inequality itself may have but when you look at the lack of literacy, uh, the lack of nutrition, uh, that is something, that is a dimension of inequality which we confront very profoundly in, uh, uh, profoundly in India. 
and it really has to be made one aspect of our strategic uh, uh, strategic thinking and uh, especially when we talk about China India comparisons I mean whatever else the Chinese did wrong uh, one thing which they did right and perhaps because of the immense power uh, of the state in that country uh, they utilized it to deliver uh, public health and public education in a manner in which we had not done as uh, well. And I think uh, when you come to institutions of this kind and you see the efforts which have been made uh, to educate genera generation after generation uh, of uh, young women and young men, uh, it's a wonderful feeling. So thank you very much, Admiral, for organizing this, uh, Air Marshal, for organizing this here. And thank you very much again, uh, Women's uh, Christian College, for the audience, but also for giving us an opportunity to come to this uh, wonderful institution. Uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs, which I represent, uh, is in many ways a unique institution. Uh, it is possibly, it's certainly India's oldest uh, uh, foreign policy think tank, but possibly it is also Asia's oldest foreign policy think tank. It was set up uh, in the early 1940s and it was meant to evolve an independent uh, perspective on uh, international uh, uh, affairs. Now, one point which a number of speakers made and something which I think resonates, so the more we have these debates outside uh, Delhi in different parts of the country, I think the stronger will be the consensus around foreign policy. But more than the consensus, there will also be uh, uh, a much more enriching uh, discussion and debate. Uh, the perspective which you have uh, in our northeastern states on Myanmar or on Bangladesh or even on China, the perspective which you have in Punjab and Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the perspective you have in Tamil Nadu or in the other southern states is quite different from the perspective on many critical issues. The view in the northeast about Myanmar, the view in the northeast about Bangladesh, the view in the northeast about China is different in many ways because it's much more granular. Similarly, the perspectives in Punjab and Jammu and Kashmir, even in Rajasthan on Pakistan, will be qualitatively of a different uh, character. They may not be totally different, but they will add something to the national uh, debate. And similarly, I think the debate on uh, maritime issues and our emerging maritime consciousness has to be, the lead in that has to be taken by uh, uh, the coastal states because surely if that debate is left uh, to the confines of New Delhi, it will not be of a quality which it, uh, which it could be. Now, I don't want to repeat uh, what has already transpired, neither am I competent to summarize uh, the debate, but I thought I'd share some thoughts which came to my mind as I heard different presentations. Uh, <clears throat> one point which I made in the discussion in the morning, uh, and perhaps some of the, in the audience were uh, not there, I will repeat, which is, uh, the, uh, which is the different approaches which the military mind and the diplomatic mind have to strategic and foreign policy uh, issues. And I say this because there are so many military officers who have participated in the discussions uh, yesterday and today. As I said, the military mind is trained uh, uh, to evaluate capacities and prepare responses accordingly. Uh, the diplomatic mind or the political mind looks at other issues which is interests and intent. And these are two fundamentally different uh, disciplines. And it's important to keep this in mind because the policy prescriptions both provide are quite different. So to my mind it is very important that diplomats think as diplomats and not think like generals or not think like soldiers. And equally, soldiers think like soldiers, or general thinks like, think like th generals, and not try to think like diplomats. Because these are two different disciplines, and we should try to keep the two separate as far as possible, and integrate them when we are making policy. Because policy, to be sustainable, to be coherent, uh, and, and to be effective, has to take both these critical inputs uh, uh, into account. Now, I think the strategic uh, assessments uh, is something which we need to uh, think about. That what is strategic and what is tactical? Because often, uh, often there is a, 
mixing up of the tactical and the strategic. And this, to my mind, is happening more and more with the democratization of the debate around strategic and foreign policy uh, issues, especially because of the impact of talk shows on television. So tactical issues and strategic issues often get mixed up. And let me give you an example. We spoke a great deal about uh, Dokulam and the crisis there and the standoff uh, there. I think Dokulam is very interesting because what it showed was that while China as a strategic uh, entity has so much more power in terms of economic power, military power, uh, even diplomatic uh, power. But translating that strategic uh, power into tactical dominance is not easy. Uh, so what they discovered was that notwithstanding all their numerous other strengths, man for man on Dukhlam, there was nothing they could do. Now it's an important point to remember that how do you trans how do you relate strategic uh, power to tactical uh, dominance? And this is a this is an issue many countries have uh, have confronted. Uh, if you look at, for instance, Saudi Arabia in Yemen. Now Saudi Arabia, in many ways, has a strategically dominant position, but on the ground they find that that strategic advantage doesn't translate into tactical uh, advantage. Uh, the same situation exists with regard to, uh, with regard to, for instance, uh, uh, the United States and Iran. The United States, despite its vast strategic advantages and uh, you know near hegemonic position in the in the Persian or in the Arabian Gulf. Nevertheless, cannot translate that strategic dominance into tactical uh, dominance. Now, I'm simplifying a bit, but the point is simply this, that strategic strength doesn't automatically translate into tactical, uh, uh, tactical dominance or tactical strength. Now, this is a lesson which we also have to apply to our own, uh, to our own neighborhood, for instance, with regard, to, uh, with regard to Pakistan, because strategically, uh, if you see the trajectories of India and Pakistan from the early 1990s, they have diverged very considerably. Uh, the last time India went to the IMF for a loan facility was in 1991 or 1992. It was around the same time that Pakistan also went for a loan facility to the IMF in 1989 and 1990. Now since then we never had to go to the IMF. Pakistan has gone possibly 9 or 10 uh, times and in every conceivable way, uh, its society, its economy, uh, numerous, many of its institutions have lagged far behind the progress which we have uh, made. So, so in some senses, your strategic power has outstripped Pakistan's very considerably. But does that translate into tactical uh, dominance? It doesn't, as we know from our from our own experience. Now, this I think is an important lesson to keep in mind as we look at uh, as we look at how to handle some of these difficult issues uh, in the uh, in the future and one takeaway for me uh, is that there is no tactical solution to the solution to the problems we have with difficult uh, neighbors there's no military uh, game changer which we can apply we can send we can use tactical instruments to send political messages but it will not assure to us a tactical dominance which we may which we may want because we are looking essentially because then because what the, the problem is that you will not be able to use these instruments to get political answers and many of the problems which we have uh, are really political in nature so this to me really is one takeaway which i would always keep in mind when we deal with difficult Neighbors, because one lesson of history certainly is that let's not confuse uh, your own uh, internal strengths, your strategic uh, advantages in uh, dealing with day-to-day -day situations or in crafting policies to deep-rooted political uh, issues. <clears throat> the second point which We've discussed a great deal about, and to some extent, has already been 
has been touched on in the subsequent discussions was about the cultural realm, soft power, uh, and so on. And particularly when we look at the Bay of Bengal littoral or when we look at uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the Indian influence is, of course, uh, uh, clear. When you go to Myanmar, you go to Vietnam, you go to Indonesia, you go to Cambodia, uh, you go to Thailand, uh, and so on. And we spoke a great deal about uh, the influence of the spread of Sanskrit, the, the, the impact of the Cholas, uh, any visit to Angkor Wat brings out the Indian connection uh, very dramatically. Now, this is something which interests me a little because much of what we say today is derived from a very active debate which took place in India in the 1920s, 1930s and 1940s when a group of uh, intellectuals and scholars uh, confronted or tried to address this uh, spread of Indian uh, influence in a scholarly manner. Uh, now this was uh, really the outcome of uh, Rabindranath Tagore when he travelled to Southeast Asia, when he travelled to uh, China. But this group of people, and they, they grew in numbers as through the 1920s and 1930s, they formed together a society called the Society of Greater India. Uh, and they started coming out with a journal sometime in the 19, early 1930s called the journal, the, the journal of the Greater India Society. Uh, now these were anthropologists, archaeologists, linguists, historians, uh, and some names were very prominent among them. Uh, R.C. Majumdar, who wrote uh, a book on a two-volume history called the Swarnavi, uh, Hindu Colonies in the Far East, that was the subtitle. He wrote another book called Cambodia, the Kingdom of Cambodia, an ancient Hindu colony uh, in Southeast Asia. Then there was uh, Nilkanta Shastri from Chennai, and he wrote a number of uh, essays and also a book called, I think it was called, uh, South Indian influence in Southeast Asia or Tamil influence in Southeast Asia and he once famously described uh, the Bay of Bengal as a Chola Lake. Now, <clears throat> now this was a great intellectual and uh, academic and scholarly uh, endeavor. I mean, one example of this is Asi Majumdar was a lecturer in the University of Mushirabad, really a backwater and he was interested in studying Indonesia but found that most of the work on it till then had been done by Dutch uh, archaeologists because it was a Dutch colony. So in Murshidabad, he first ta taught himself Dutch so he could read the original uh, sources and uh, access all the epigraphic uh, uh, material. Now, it's in, the question to ask is not that there was this interest. The question to ask is why did this scholarly interest uh, not persist? And why, from the 1950s onwards, this particular movement, the Greater India Movement, which talked about the great imprint of Indian culture in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, why did it become weaker and finally why did it die out? Uh, and it's an interesting question and I think the answer is important for us uh, today. To my mind, the answer was that the, the weaknesses of the scholarly endeavor became clear when other, when other work was being done and they said that this was by no means uh, an Indian colonial enterprise. It was a much more complex uh, process. And this was the work which was being done by many Europeans, some of which was biased, some of which didn't like to give so much primacy to India, but a lot of it was also scholarly and very substantive in nature. But they said that this fundamental premise of uh, your being a kind of an imperial influence in Southeast Asia, this, this view is wrong. Uh, the second reason, of course, was the pushback in Southeast Asia itself. Uh, and the pushback began in Myanmar uh, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, primarily as a move to expel Indians uh, from, that, uh, from that country. And I think both these things happening together led to a rethink that perhaps this was not an enterprise in the way we would like to think of itself, uh, we would like to think of as a, 
as an injection of Indian culture into Southeast Asia. Because possibly what had happened was that many, many places in Southeast Asia, many kingdoms there, were exposed to Indian influences, but they decided what they would take. It was, in that sense, not a colonial imperial uh, enterprise, because the agency remained with the Southeast Asians themselves. And this is what someone referred to the resentment there is in Indonesia when you talk about uh, Indian influences. Uh, I think the, the point they are making is that we took what we wanted. You didn't give us. We took it and we preserved it. And I think it's important to bear that in mind because uh, to this day, uh, many countries in Southeast Asia interpret uh, our positions on what we see as Indian culture. They see an element of condescension. They see an element as... Uh, uh, as a kind of uh, vanity, which is uh, resented, I think we should we should keep this in uh, we should uh, keep this in uh, uh, in mind. Uh, the other point which I wanted to talk about was uh, which was discussed a great deal, which was about the maritime consciousness and our consciousness of the uh, of the Indian Ocean, <laughs> the dynamic between the continental and the uh, maritime and uh, now uh, Shekhar Sinha referred to this uh, uh, I think he put it very well uh, that to a great extent uh, I'm trying to simplify what he says I mean, what he said was that Southeast Asia and the Eastern Indian Ocean sucks out all the oxygen of the room when we talk about the Indian Ocean because there's also the Western Indian Ocean and while we talk a great deal about the Bay of Bengal we don't talk enough about the Arabian Sea. And especially so, we don't talk enough about the Arabian Sea literal. Because our vital interests in the Arabian Sea literal are quite considerable. If you look at the millions of Indians who live and uh, work there, our hydrocarbon uh, dependencies, the kind of investment dependencies which are uh, emerging as a market for our goods and so on and uh, so, uh, so forth. So the Arabian Sea literal, and all the way, in fact, beyond the Arabian Sea literal, all the way to uh, to the eastern coast of Africa, is I think something which we need to focus much more on because the situation we face there uh, is very difficult. Uh, if you look at the Bay of Bengal literal uh, and beyond the Bay of Bengal literal into the uh, you know to, uh, in towards South Korea, Japan, China, and so on, now. Yes, the China factor is there, South China Sea is there. Uh, there. There are a host of latent tensions and frictions and so on. But there are also a number of uh, intergovernmental institutions which moderate and modulate these tensions and frictions. Uh, you have BIMSTEC, you have ASEAN, you have ASEAN plus 3, ASEAN plus 6, you have ADMM, you have ADMM plus, you have the East Asia Summit uh, process. And underwriting all this, you have enormous uh, uh, inter, uh, interdependencies between all the countries in that, uh, uh, in, that, in that region. So while, yes, there are Japanese, China issues, there are South Korea, Japan issues, there are issues which ASEAN has with uh, China and so on and so forth, but all of them get modulated by these intergovernmental institutions which the intergovernmental regional institutions, but they also get further modulated by the supply chain linkages which exist between all these uh, economies. So while, yes, we have to keep a track on what China is doing and so on and so forth, our vital interests are there in the Bay of Bengal, literal and beyond, but on the whole, that region is, frictions and conflicts in that region are uh, mediated and modulated and moderated by a number of factors. Now, if you look at the Arabian Sea, it is like a zoo in comparison. Uh, uh, you have all kinds of tensions, you have all kinds of uh, uh, conflicts. They are not even latent conflicts, they are real conflicts. And you have vital interests of India, which are very, very, which will appear very fragile when you look at the scale of conflict in that, uh, in that region. You have Iran, Saudi Arabia, you have Pakistan, you have Saudi Arabia, Yemen, you have all the regional concerns which exist about a Shia crescent being consolidated by uh, Iran. And if you look further east, you have 
the situation in Somalia, etc., uh, etc. Et and what makes this striking is that there is no intergovernmental arrangement which is there to moderate or modulate or even discuss these, uh, uh, these issues. IORA is there, IRA is there, but it's still a relatively weak mechanism because all these countries are not uh, represented uh, in it. I think the Navy possibly has some sense of this when they push IONS, but the IONS is a much wider, uh, much, much wider concept. Uh, the point in brief is I think we need to pay much more attention to the Arabian Sea literal and to the Western Indian Ocean uh, than, we, uh, than we do. In many ways, uh, while the, the Eastern Indian Ocean has graduated, uh, uh, I, I like to say that I feel that it has graduated from the ghosts of 1979. Uh, 1979 was a you know, fundamentally transformative year uh, for world history, but especially for uh, for India, while the eastern, while the western Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea littoral is trapped by the ghosts of 1979. Why 1979? 1979 saw uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. It saw the Shia revolution in Iran. It saw the execution of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in Pakistan, and it saw it saw, uh, saw the rise of Islamic. Uh, radicalism in Saudi Arabia aimed at toppling the Wahhabi state which exists over there, the Saudi state which exists over there. Uh, on the eastern side, this was the year of the Vietnam-China uh, border or rail war. Uh, you had, uh, and you had the first signs that there was a genocide taking place in uh, in Cambodia, which really set back. Uh, ASEAN's efforts to, to come to a common, basic common understanding amongst countries in Southeast Asia. Now, what has happened since is that very evidently Southeast Asia and that wider region has moved well beyond 1979, which is not to say there are no conflicts. You have something like the Rohingya issue in, uh, in Myanmar, but nevertheless, they have set up interlocking arrangements which enables them to address these uh, issues. While on, our, on the Arabian Sea literal, it's very much trapped, it's frozen in time in many ways by the forces released uh, in 1979. And therefore, I feel that uh, for India, not for any altruistic reason, but because of our vital interests in uh, the Arabian uh, Sea literal, we really have to fo focus um, much more uh, on that. Uh, I think I've taken enough. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. I found the seminar uh, personally a very enriching uh, uh, experience. I congratulate Professor uh, M. Hashim uh, again, although he does have a professorial uh, air about him uh, after his uh, retirement, and I do hope he will uh, organize uh, other such events in the future also. Thank you very much. For